Welcome back to First Chapter Friday. This week, I'm going to be reading the first chapter of Much Ado About Baseball by Rajani LaRocca. Let's dive right in. This novel has alternating chapters between two characters. The first is from the perspective of Trish. So here is chapter one. Baseball is magic. Baseball is magic. Time stops between the instant the ball is released and when it makes it over the plate, between the whack of the bat and when the ball finally touches earth again. And this summer I was holding on to that magic for dear life. The threads tying me to everything important had snapped and I was a balloon floating, flying away on the breeze with nothing to tether me. I was in a new town surround surrounded by new kids, yanked away from everyone who knew and accepted me. My brother Sanjay and I were playing catch on a stifling June afternoon in the backyard of our new home. You'll never be the strongest, so you need to play the smartest, he said as he threw me a scorcher. Sanjay's in high school and he throws hard, but I got used to hand stinging catches a long time ago. I'd already run my two miles and finished my push-ups and sit-ups for the day. Physically, I was ready. What if no one wants me on the team, I asked, tossing it back. I just left a town where the boys were used to seeing me on a baseball field, but I didn't know what to expect here. Sanjay caught the ball and laughed. You're a great teammate, not to mention an amazing ball player, he said. You hit, you run, you deserve a gold glove for fielding, and you already throw four seam and two seam fastballs. If you can make that circle change up motion look exactly like your fastball, you'll be a hero. He tossed the, high, the ball high in the air, and I moved a few steps to get under it. Sanjay was my hero, and he believed in me no matter what. The ball smacked into my glove. I'm just so... He waited for me to finish, but I didn't want to say the word out loud. Lost. I suppose I could always quit. That might make mom, mom happy at least. Trish, dad called from the garage. We need to leave now if you want to be read early. I tossed the ball back to Sanjay and waved goodbye. Ready to meet your new team? Dad smiled and squeezed my shoulder, but that didn't stop my pulse from pounding in my throat. Yeah, I took a deep breath. I had to be the best. That's the only way I'd ever be accepted. So that's what I was going to do this summer. Mom was at work at the hospital, of course, when she landed the chief of cardiology job at Boston General Hospital. It was too good to pass up. Dad could run his graphic design business from anywhere, so we uprooted ourselves from our little town in New Hampshire and moved to Comedy, Massachusetts. While Sanjay and I weren't thrilled about changing schools, we didn't have a choice. I knew my brother would be fine. He was so smart and cute and hilarious. I was already weird as a baseball player, a girl baseball player, and a math kid. Well, I used to be a math kid. And now I had to make friends with a team full of strangers. I'd missed travel team tryouts, but I was fine playing in a casual town league. No long trips to games for any of us. And the games were all on weekends. So I hoped that mom could come and see at least a few and not worry about taking too much time off work. Although I knew she'd bring her laptop and would need to keep asking what the score was. We pulled into the parking lot 15 minutes before practice was supposed to start. Are you sure you don't want me to stay? Dad asked. I shook my head. I'll be fine. I needed to make an impression on my own. I'll see you in a couple of hours. I smiled in what I hoped was a convincing way as I picked up my bag and climbed out of the car. I knew it was my last season playing ball. 12 year olds like me play little league on a 60 foot diamond with 46 feet between the pitcher's mound and the plate. But in the spring, we move up to the big diamond, which is the size of a major league infield, 90 feet between bases and 60 feet, six inches from the pitcher's mound to home plate. Lots of boys were already bigger than me. They were growing every second, becoming faster and stronger overnight without even trying. I had serious doubts I'd be able to compete in the spring on the big field, and that was so hard, even harder than moving. I stopped to survey the baseball fields at Bailey Park. There were two smaller fields and one full-size diamond where some older boys or older players were warming up. 
The smell of fresh cut grass and lilacs floated to me. I took a deep breath. There was something in the air, something that hung like the moment when you take a breath to blow out your birthday candles and you're not sure what to wish for. I approached the big field where a boy was wearing a remarkably sparkly green baseball cap, stood at the plate taking practice swings. That hat was incredible. If a baseball cap married a glittery unicorn toy, this would be their baby. As the pitch came in, the boy swung gracefully and was rewarded with the crack of the ball meeting the sweet swat of, spot of the bat. The ball sailed over center field, over the fence, and dropped onto the street behind it. If this guy could hit like that, with a wooden bat no less, he could wear a wizard hat and nobody would notice or care. An outfielder hopped the fence to retrieve the ball and everyone else turned back to the boy at the plate who nodded for another pitch. The pitcher wound up and let go. Crack, another perfect swing and another perfect shot that sailed over left field and bounced off a parked car. It sounded like it left a mammoth dent. Then the kid switched to a lefty stance and nodded. The pitcher laughed and shook his head, but then wound up and threw again. This time the ball sailed over right field and into a dog park where a golden retriever grabbed it and ran, tail swinging. How in the world was that boy hitting home runs from both sides of the plate with every single swing? Statistically, that was impossible. If this was the level of talent here in comedy, I was in trouble. I hurried on my way before I lost my nerve completely and soon arrived at one of the smaller fields where a coach and a boy were setting up for practice. Hello there, said the coach, reaching out and shaking my hand. He was a tiny, he was tiny and redheaded, like a slightly oversized elf. I'm Coach Tom and this is my son, David. Nice to meet you, Coach. Hi, David, I said, I'm Trish. Happy to have you on the team this summer, said the coach. My breathing eased up a little. Apparently, Coach Tom didn't care that I was a girl. You two can start warming up while we wait for everyone else, he said. David, who was already half a foot taller than his dad, nodded and held up a baseball. I ran out onto the field, and he started firing throws at me. After a few minutes, David lobbed the ball way over my head, and it landed on a dead patch and rolled into the woods. I went in after it and saw a boy there crouched behind a tree with his eyes squeezed shut. He looked as nervous as I felt. Here for practice, I asked. The boy opened his eyes and glanced at me and I couldn't believe it. I recognized him immediately. Ben, the brilliant math kid who challenged me to do better than ever at the New England Math Puzzler Regionals a couple of months ago. He'd been the only sixth grader on his team, just like me and the best on his team, just like me. I had seen the challenge in Ben's eyes and I was sure no one could beat him. Neither of our teams won the tournament, but I couldn't believe it when they said I'd gotten the highest individual score. Ben had only missed two points in the final round, but to my surprise, I'd only missed one, or so I thought. Standing there in the woods with sunlight filtering through the trees around us and the birds making a riotous racket, I could tell Ben didn't recognize me. No surprise there, since I'd chopped off all my hair since the last time I saw him. He was dressed for baseball and carried a sports bag big enough to hold a bat. My mind whirled. I didn't think I'd ever have to face him again. I pulled my cap lower over my eyes. Ben picked up the ball and tossed it to me underhand. It landed a couple feet in front of me. Sorry, Ben said, turning red. Come on, I said, scooping the ball and trotting onto the field. My mouth went dry when Coach Tom called us all in. We stood in a circle while the coach handed out our uniforms. Ben stood next to another kid and they put their heads together and whispered and laughed easily. I wondered if I'd ever have a friend like that here in comedy. A new local business has donated our jerseys to support the league, so our team name is the Comedy Salt Shakers, he said, or said Coach Tom. I glanced down at the shirt he handed me, green, blue, and white with a salt shaker logo, lucky number seven. Too bad I didn't believe in luck. Hard work was the only way to success. Our team had 13, 11, and 12-year-olds in total. Everyone took turns introducing themselves. Ben's friend was named Ad 
Ad, Abdi, Abdi. Other players included David and the Mitchell twins, Mike and Garrett. Mike was almost as big as David with blonde hair that reached his shoulders while Garrett was short, skinny, and dark skin, dark haired with a rat-like nose and bored expression. The other two seventh graders on the team were Campbell, a blonde kid with braces who never stopped smiling, and Brad, who announced to everyone that he could ride a unicycle. Like that had something to do with baseball. There were five tiny, soon-to-be sixth graders. This included two boys named Aiden and a freckle-faced kid named George. And then it was my turn. I swallowed hard. I'm Trish. I'll be in seventh grade next year. I looked around, hoping desperately that someone would say something or smile or nod, but no one did. Not David, who already knew who I was. Not Ben. He seemed stunned, like a line drive had clocked him in the forehead. Did I look that much like a boy? Or had he finally recognized me from the math puzzler tournament? I crossed my sweaty arms and stared each of them down in turn. I just moved here from South Ridgefield, New Hampshire. I've been playing ball since I was three. I have three pitches and I was first in my team's rotation this spring. I'd learned the hard way that you can't show weakness on the field or in the classroom. Coach Tom smacked his fist into his glove. Who's ready to practice? Let's start with grounders. Come with me and I'll explain the first drill. We all followed him onto the field. By the time practice ended, I'd caught every pop-up that came my way, hit line drives onto the, into the outfield, and shown off my two-seamer. When we gathered in the dugout, George, the freckle-faced sixth grader, tipped his cap at me. The mismatched twins studied me with interest, and Avdi gave me a crooked smirk. Ben stared at me with his bright blue eyes, and I felt exhilarated, like I was back at the math puzzler tournament. He'd flubbed some easy catches, though, and most of his throws had been either too short or way too long. I guessed his nerves had gotten the best of him. As we packed up to leave, Garrett went up to Ben. Cool shirt. It was a cool shirt. I'd noticed it right away, and it had made me smile, on the inside at least. It said, there are 10 kinds of people, those who understand binary and those who don't. Thanks, said Ben. Did you bring your calculator? Garrett asked. Ben zipped his bag and looked at him. Why would I? Maybe it'll help you estimate where you need to stand to actually catch something, said Garrett. He and his brother snickered and walked away. What a jerk. Like the toad, ugly and venomous, Abdi said to Ben. Don't worry about him. You're just rushed, rusty because you haven't played in a couple of years. Ben shook his head and mumbled something. I couldn't hear it. You'll be fine, Abdi said. You just need more practice. Come over and we can throw a ball around after dinner. I told my mom that I'd eat at home tonight. Maybe tomorrow? Sounds good. They bumped fists. And to my surprise, Abdi turned to me. I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks and ever thanks, Abdi said, bowing like I was royalty. Was he making fun of me? <clears throat> ben rolled his eyes. Is this really the right situation for that quote? Of course. If Trish hadn't won the math puzzler championship this spring, you wouldn't be playing ball this summer. She's a good luck charm already. Right, Trish? Abdi gave me a grin as my face heated up. What did that mean? But before I could ask anything, Abdi took off to the parking lot. Ben finished packing up. Was he, ner as, was he as nervous as I felt? Maybe I could help him. I needed to try. Ben and I both love math and baseball. I hoped we could be friends. Is your glove broken in? Maybe that's the problem, I said. I don't have a problem. Ben shoved his batting gloves into his bag. Just because you're a star pitcher and math champion doesn't mean you know everything. He hoisted his bag and sprinted to the woods as I spoke fluttered word fragments to his retreating back. I wondered if he resented having a girl on his baseball team or if he was still upset about the math tournament or both. I plodded to the parking lot to wait for dad. I needed to find a way to feel good in my skin and on the field again and eventually in the classroom. And there was Ben, the boy whose brilliance pushed me to my best, my math motivator. He hated me, and he didn't even know all of why he should. 
I wasn't going to be able to keep my secret for much longer. Baseball was magic, and this summer, I needed that magic to work for me. That's the end of chapter one. Chapter two is from Ben's perspective. I hope that you are intrigued enough to read Much Ado About Baseball by Rajani <clears throat> LaRocca. And you can find this from the Alameda Free Library. See you next time on First Chapter Friday.